Well, I find that we can look at the way we relate to ourselves and, and discover the parallel from how our parents treated us. And our parents, out of concern, out of fear for how well we'd emerge as beings, ended up being very critical, many of them. And so we took on criticism, self-criticism, as a way of trying to strong arm ourselves into being the person that we thought we should be. And, and pretty much most of us received a message in some way that to be loved and to be approved of, we needed to be different than we were. So you're using the term, uh, it's kind of masquerading out of care. Out of care for ourselves, we try to make ourselves different. It seemed that way. Now, it's a strategy. It just happens to be a strategy that ends up bringing a lot of suffering. I, I call it a false refuge. We take a kind of false refuge in, in judgment and in, um, in, in being at war with ourselves in order to be something different. And it's only when, and there's, there's some wisdom in each of us that starts catching on to the fact that these patterns just aren't working. The strategy is not delivering. It gives enough of a temporary fix that we stay hooked. But gradually as we mature, we start getting, oh, the judgment's not working, the eating is not really helping me feel better, or whatever the strategy is. My workaholism isn't really ending up making me feel like a better person. All my striving to achieving, I still don't feel at home with myself. Then we start questioning in a really good way. And we start saying, okay, those were masquerading for self-care. What would it really mean in this life to be uh, offering ourselves the kind of care, the kind of messages, the kind of guidance that would bring some happiness? Right. So it's, it's a critical shift. Can you, um, from your own practice and working with others as well, Perhaps name some of the somatic markers, that's a term that's about like an inner signal, a felt sense, yeah. a signal. Like how can a person feel or know the difference between, um, we'll call it authentic, wholesome self-caring and this sort of imposter self-caring, this near enemy, if you will? For me, it's uh, very, very clear that when I am... Um, offering what seems like self-care, but, but, but it's coming from a place of fear and a place of, of self-doubt, there is a squeeze and a tension. And often it shows itself in the throat, the chest, and the belly because there's a nexus of nerves there that, that our um, emotions end up most expressing through. But it could be in other parts of our body too. But there's some form of unpleasant tension or tightness. It's confining. Whereas... In the moments of genuine self-care, there is always a sense of opening and tenderness. Now, tenderness has different felt sense for different people, but there's some quality of um, resonance, of, of um, presence with that one can feel, and there's a sense often of warmth and a sense of um, expansiveness. And I can say for myself, there's a shift in identity. And it's something that, this isn't somatic language, but it's important language. Because what happens in a moment of self-care is rather than being um, caught in the waves of what's going on and reacting to ourselves, we actually open and become more like an ocean, our presence, that's relating to the waves. And that shift of being, you know, fighting ourselves and being another wave, clashing with a wave, to being the ocean, is a shift in identity. And it's a very profound spiritual kind of awakening that happens, that we realize we're more than the judgmental self and we're more than the judge self. Uh, there's a quality of tender presence that becomes a more familiar sense of who we are. Let's say our parent didn't notice we were uncomfortable, or our parent maybe noticed, but it was, it was like a hassle. And so there was a sense of responsive irritability, or let's say there was judgment. You know, we end up relating to our own needs with that same impatience, or judgment, or ignoring, or neglect. So part of the beginning of cultivating self-care is to begin to notice those patterns. And we start, even if we can't offer self-care, because sometimes we're blocked, and the blocks are, um, I don't deserve it. 
you know, feeling I'm, I'm such a bad person, I don't deserve it, or other people have it worse. You know, we have reasons not to offer it. But we can have an intention, and that's the, that'll open the door. So that even if you can't really um, fully in an embodied way say, I care, um, you can know that some part of you wants to be able to care. And even that, even that, that even the beginning of the intention towards self-care, a kind of prayer aspiration to be able to offer self-care will begin to open the door. And I, I say that on purpose because so many of us have such a hard time offering kindness to our own being. Right. Um, you know, other people have various attitudes or stances toward our needs, our longings, our hurts, our wounds. And we then internalize those attitudes yeah. toward us, and then that becomes our own attitude toward ourselves. And a exactly. process, that's, as you well know, as a psychologist, a very natural one, but one that creates a ton of suffering and harm. Um, you used the key word there, needs, and in part because this pillar of well-being is the first for everything, this is an opportunity as people engage this consideration of self-caring to really be open to and face squarely and see clearly one's own needs and then use this Foundations of Well-Being program as a way to build resources inside to really address those needs and to have an increasingly unconditional, internalized sense of resources for those needs that you carry with you wherever you go. So you get less and less dependent upon external resources to give you that very important healthy experience, etc. So to face needs, right? And the ground level in order to face needs is we have to be able to pause and listen inward. Uh, the beginning of everything is some willingness just to stop in our tumbling into the future. We're always on our way somewhere. And 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 pay attention, sense ask that question, what's happening inside me right now? I mean, Rumi, I said it so beautifully, he says, do you make regular visits to yourself? I mean, so, we, so we need to be able to pay attention. I often think of, you know, if, what are, if you're like an infant, what are the most important things to you? And most of us would in some way say, well, it's to be seen, you know, that somebody gets me, and to be loved. And so in any moment that we can pause and and pay attention and see what's going on and offer kindness in those moments we're really nourishing our deepest level of needs. Right. Self-caring being at bottom, I think two of the three key aspects of self-caring are, you've said two right there, the seeing of what's really true with yeah. a warm-heartedness, a caring, yeah. a loving, a compassion. I think the third also is implicit in something you said earlier, Often it means taking action uh, towards self-caring, like whether it's eating less or speaking up more, looking for a different job. I've been working for decades now with what I described as this pivotal juncture in people's transformation when there's actually this movement towards practicing self-compassion. And I have found across the board that it's the precursor to authentic compassion for others that until there is self-compassion, compassion towards others has a slightly abstract or conceptual kind of cast. It's not, it's not fully embodied. It could it's be sincere, a, but it's incomplete in some way. Yeah, and the reason it's incomplete is to feel compassion, you have to feel in a very physical, somatic way vulnerability. In other words, you have to be able to feel in your body what we tend to pull away from feeling. You have to have the courage to contact the fear, the shame, the sorrows. And, and that takes a commitment. But when we can do that, then there's a natural tenderness that opens up. So in the way that compassion unfolds, the very part of our mind, that the mindfulness that can contact without pulling away what's there, actually is the precursor to compassion. We need to have that mindful contact with what's there in our bodies. And when we can do that and feel the self-compassion, we have this, we, I can be with you and have the tolerance and the courage to open to, oh, that's where you're feeling insecure or ashamed. And then you get included in this widening circle of care. 
So sometimes people think, well, self-compassion, and that sounds, again, self, but it's actually not self-compassion. It's compassion for the life that's right here that allows us to then widen and widen to include all of life. Right. And that life that's right here is here because of our interconnectedness with all kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, of course. Uh, I often think about this moment of experience uh, in this, in this body altogether as like a certain a knot in a larger tapestry through which all mm. kinds of ripples are streaming and there's this local expression of the larger fabric of ultimately reality altogether, uh, you know, moving through, right? Beautiful. Yeah. So thank you. Oh, thank you.